Sometimes you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air, I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy, yes he You gotta praise in the prison, cry out to heaven, shout until the door swing wide. Sometimes you gotta stand on your shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy of all of the praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the Blessings day and night, countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept Goodness every step, each and every breath I'll praise you anywhere, faithful all my life Blessings day and night, countless reasons why I'll praise you anywhere, every promise kept Goodness every step, each and every Breath. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy. Yes, he is worthy of all of the praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. I think sometimes as we uh, follow Jesus, I think in that journey, it can feel like their times are good and it's easy to see what God is up to in your life. But I think there's other times, and maybe some of you are walking in with uh, some of these going on, circumstances that are hard to see what God is up to. It can be all sorts of things, uh, whatever it might be, health, it might be uh, challenges with some of the relationships in your life. It could be anything. I think sometimes it's, it's difficult to see what God's doing in those moments. I think in my life, that's been true. There's been times where it's like, man, I don't really see what you're up to, God. What are you doing right now? But I think in those moments, I can bank on his faithfulness to me. I can bank on years of history of walking with him, not knowing what he's up to then, but seeing in hindsight what he's been doing. I think sometimes... If you don't have a lot of that history, sometimes you just need others. Sometimes you need others who are claiming that for you. Sometimes it's this gathering. It's being able to be together with other people who can recount his history, recount the story of God at work that gets you through some of those difficult times. So we're going to do one of those songs. I want to just invite you to sing it out from the depths of where you're at today. Oh, mm -hmm. 
God, we're thankful today. We can declare your goodness in this place, that you are a God who is faithful. Wherever we are as we come in here today, God, whether it's a season where it's easy to see you, where things are incredible, where we can sense your direction, your leading, God, thank you for that. Thank you for what a gift that that is. For others who might be walking in and not knowing where you are or what you're up to, God, would you instill in us a sense of trust a sense of being able to bank on your goodness and your faithfulness generation after generation after generation. And God, could we trust you with the unknown? 
Would you help us to trust you with whatever is ahead that we can look to you, that even when we don't see it, that you are working. Teach us what it means to follow you. We want to give glory to your name. We want to be part of proclaiming your faithfulness for generations to come. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Everyone said it together. Amen. Amen. Well, y'all go ahead and take a seat. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Welcome to those of you in the room and those of you who are joining us online. We just feel so thankful that you would spend a Sunday with us. And an extra special welcome to those of you in the room where this is your first time. Uh, if you are new here, maybe this is your first time, maybe it's one of your first times, we would love to say hi to you. We wanna get to know your name, a little bit about you, and we actually have a special gift just for saying thanks for joining us today. And so you can say hello out at our Next Steps area. We've got staff and volunteers out there who would love to meet you and talk with you. And hey, we believe around here that actually everyone has a next step of faith. So whether you've been around here for a long time or it's your first day, we all have a next step. And so if you wanna talk about what that could be, have a conversation about that, get signed up, you can head to our Next Steps area. They'd be happy to help you with that. And one next step that we are really excited to be able to celebrate with some people coming up is actually baptism. So we love celebrating baptisms around here because they remind us of the ways that God has been actively at work in people's lives to get them to a place of saying that they're ready to publicly declare their faith in Jesus and him alone as their Lord and Savior. So if that's you, if you have made that decision, but you haven't yet taken the step to get baptized, that could be an awesome next step for you. So uh, if you would like to talk about that and come to our baptism that's coming up at the end of April, we would love to, to just have a conversation about what that could look like. So you can talk to any of us up here at the front or again, Next Steps is a great place to talk about that. And then coming up really soon here is Holy Week. So uh, that is gonna be a week just full of different ways for us to connect as a church um, and just reflect on the last days of Jesus. And so first coming up, if you wanna follow along with me, it'll be on the screens. You also could pull up our website, blackhawk.church slash Easter, and you can follow along and see all these opportunities. So the first is gonna be Maundy Thursday. That is on Thursday, March 28th. And we're gonna have uh, services both at 6.30 and at 8 at Braider Way at Fitchburg. There's gonna be an online option as well. And this is an opportunity for us to um, kind of reflect on the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples um, and his command to love one another. It is unlike any other service. It's unlike a Sunday morning. And so a lot of people say it's one of their favorites of the year. So maybe consider joining us for one of those. And then on Friday, the next day, there's a couple of different options for Good Friday and how you might celebrate that. So High Point is hosting a service at 12 and at 6.30 uh, where you can come. It's for anyone, any of the churches on the west side. They're gonna have options both in English and Spanish. It's a dual language service, which is incredible. And so if you wanna join one of those, you can do that. And then we're also hosting the African American Council of Churches. They are having a service here at Braider Way at 7 p.m. on Friday. And so you're gonna hear from different Madison area African American pastors as they reflect and teach on the journey to the cross. And so anyone is welcome to join for that. That's at seven here in this space. It's gonna be incredible. And then that brings us to Easter Sunday. So we have lots of different ways that you can celebrate Easter Sunday with us. We've added a 7.30 a.m. service, so if you're an early riser, maybe you would consider that. And then we've also got our evening service at 4.30. Um, so if you're coming in late, maybe you've just coming back from a spring break vacation or a weekend away, consider joining one of those. We're gonna have special treats at those at the 7.30 and the 4.30. Uh, it'll help us also just to make room for guests and visitors who are gonna be joining us at the 9 and 10.45. So if your family can make one of those options work, maybe consider that. But we will also have our, our um, regular service times, 9 and 10.45. Uh, we're gonna have B Kids available at all the morning service, 7.39, 10.45. It won't be available at, 10, or at the 4.30 in the evening. Uh, but you can definitely join us for one of those. So maybe consider this week, who can you invite? Who are you gonna uh, invite to one of those services? We also have all of our normal uh, 9 and 10.45 online services. So if you're joining us that way, all the normal places and times you find us will be available there. But think about who you can invite and make a plan for Easter week. So, all right, that's all I have for us this morning. And I get to pass it off now to Pastor Charles for today's message.
Hi, everybody. My name is Charles. I'm one of the pastors on the teaching team. Uh, before I get into the book of James, um, I want to give you a quick update on Project Tech. Uh, last Sunday was our deadline to get your intentions in. So here are, here, here's where we stand uh, as of last Friday. Uh, we are approaching $2 million in intentions, and we have on top of that another close to $245,000 of money given without intentions. So compared to where we were two weeks ago, it's been huge, okay? It's, it's been a massive change. We made a huge improvement. So this is so fantastic. So if you have made an intention or you have started giving to Project Tech, we just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. It's wonderful. Uh, this project, we believe, is mission critical to what we're called to do as a church. Now, in the coming weeks, we're gonna be making some big decisions about what we can tackle um, on this project. So if you have not yet made an intention, we would love to have you in the game with us. Jump in, it's not too late. You can make an intention on our website. If you have any questions about Project Tech, go ahead and do that and help us you know, make up the gap. All right, that's Project Tech. <laughs> Let's get back into the book of James. Um, let me start with a, with a survey, okay? So, so, okay, if you believe, if you believe that flossing once a day, every day, is good for the health of your teeth, raise your hands. Okay, all sides, all venues. Oh, keep your hands up. All sides, all venues, all right? If you're in front of a computer, go ahead, do it. It's okay. And, and uh, okay, now, now keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. If you actually floss your teeth once a day, keep your hands up. The rest of your hands down. Whoa. Wow, it's worse than I thought. <laughs> okay, so a bit of a public service announcement. My, my dentist used to tell me, she said, people always ask me which teeth should I floss, and I always tell them, the ones you want to keep. <laughs> Just my public service announcement for the day. Why am I talking about flossing? Flossing is a great example of the relationship between faith and action, right? I think almost all the hands, not every hand, I saw a few hands didn't go up when I asked whether you believe that flossing every day is important for the health of your teeth. Almost all the hands went up. But then when it comes to action, I would say significantly less than half actually floss your teeth once a day, right? There is what we believe over here, and then we have actions. A very few of us actually take the action that flows out of that belief. So here's a question. Let's say I don't floss. Will my faith in the power of flossing save my teeth? I think the answer is an obvious no. Well, here's what we're going to learn today. That like flossing, when it comes to follow Jesus, faith that's not attached to action doesn't do a thing. That's what we're getting into today. We're looking at the book of James. It's, it's an amazing book. And we, we entitled the series, Faith in Action. And, and, and James has been as good as advertised, right? Three weeks out, we talked about how James says, teaches us, he says, hey, you need to think differently. You need to start thinking about how, how you know, if you look at trials and, and sufferings, you should consider them as pure joy. All right, two weeks ago, James tells us, what is true religion? Taking care of the, of the widows, the orphans, the powerless in their moment of distress and making sure that you are not molded and shaped by the world around you. Last week, we learned that favoritism, discrimination, has no place among the people of God. So we have read the first chapter and a half of James, and it's been nonstop action. Action, action, action. And at this point, you know, some of you may have the question, like, wait a minute. I thought following Jesus is about faith. I thought we're saved by grace through faith. How, how come there's so much focus on doing stuff? And, and then others might ask these questions, like, what, what, what if I fail to do all this stuff? What if I come up short? Will God punish me? Do I lose my salvation? These are great questions that people ask today and in the first century. That's right. People in the first century, the time of James, they were asking the same kind of questions. What is the nature of faith? What is the relationship between faith and action and salvation? Big questions. And so James, he anticipates these questions. So right in the middle of the letter, he switches gears. Yeah. Chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, the passage we're looking at today, he stops talking about action, and he answers the question, what is the relationship between faith, action, and salvation? How do they fit together? 
Now, this is obviously a big topic. I, throughout, this, is, this, this topic has been the subject of major theological debates throughout church history. There was, a, there was a famous one between Augustine and Pelagius in the fourth century. And of course, you all heard of the Protestant Reformation. Both of these debates were centered on the question of faith, action, and salvation. How do they fit? Now, I don't have time to get into the theological nuances of these debates. Okay? So what I want to do today is three things. First, we're reading the book of James. I want to do James justice. Now, we've already learned that James was written early part of church history. It was one of the first books in the New Testament that was written, um, which means James wasn't writing to answer our questions. James, James wasn't writing. He didn't know about the controversies that came later, right, decades later or even centuries later. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to read James through the lens of Paul's letters or even the Protestant Reformation. What I want to do is help us understand James on his own terms. So that's the first thing we want to do. And then two, I want us to take a step back and help us understand kind of a biblical framework for understanding faith, action, and salvation, how these three things fit together. And then finally, I don't want to spend all our time doing theology. Look, the passage is all theology. It's very rational arguments. But for an entire passage that's focused on faith must be grounded in action, it feels wrong to do nothing but theology. So I want to end our time by moving us toward a particular next step. That's a concrete way to live out our faith. So that's what's happening today. So let's get started. If you have your Bible or your smart devices, please turn to James chapter 2, and we're starting reading at verse 14. James tells us, well, he asks us, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, the Greek word is pistis, have faith but has no deeds, the Greek word is ergon, can such pistis save them? So suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, pistis by itself, if it is not accompanied by ergon, is dead. But someone will say, you have pistis, I have ergon. Show me your pistis without the ergon, and I will show you my pistis by my ergon. You believe, pisteuo, that's the verb form of, of, of faith, believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that pistis without ergon is useless? Was, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? This whole phrase, his Greek word is ek ergon, out of, out of work, out of deeds. For when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, you see that his pistis and his ergon were working together, and his pistis was made complete, ek ergon, by what he did. And the scripture was filled Fulfilled, that says, Abraham, pisteu, believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, ek ergon, and not by faith alone, ek pistis. In the same way, not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous, uh, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so pistis without ergon is dead. What is this passage about? Well, you probably can't read that, right? You don't have to. By the way, here's a, here's a, here's a hint about how to do Bible study. Print out your Bible passage on like, you know, like, you know, 8 by 11 page, double space, and then get your color pencil, get your highlighter, and just go nuts. Have fun, draw all over it. It's a great way to do Bible study. Because you can just look at this, right? You look at this, you go, what is this passage about? Oh, it's about two words. Pistis, faith, or in verb form, pisteuo, belief, and ergon, deeds or action, or doing something. And if you look at this passage, you go, oh, this pas entire passage is about the relationship between faith and deeds, pistis and ergon. And James very helpfully puts his main question right up front. Verse 14, if someone claims to have pistis but has no ergon, can such kind of pistis save them? This is the question that James wants to answer. And right from the front, we notice something, right? We notice that James is talking about a kind of faith that can exist without action. 
Right? There's a faith that exists without action. So let's call it, I call it the, the, the no action faith. Right? Let's just, you know, the no action faith. And the question that James wants to answer is, can this kind of faith, the no action faith, save a person? So he starts his argument. Right? So he starts his argument in, in the next verse, and he tells a story. He says, there's, there's a Christ follower who lacks clothing and food. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed. Very kind words, very nice sentiments, right? I desire that you are warm and well-fed. But then James says, if you don't do anything about it, what's the point? Right? James, James is making a simple point here. He's saying sometimes some words, some words require action or they're meaningless. Some words require action or the meaning. I'll give you an example. Let's say at the beginning of a meal, I have some friends, you know, we're at a restaurant, and I say, hey, everybody, this is my treat. And everybody's like, oh, wow, Charles, you're so nice, right? You're so generous, right? They, and, we, and we eat our dinner. But if at the end of the dinner, I don't pull on my credit card, I don't pay the bill. That word, those words, my treat, that sentiment of generosity, completely meaningless, completely useless, right? Certain words require action or they're meaningless. They're dead. And James says, there's a kind of faith that's like that. Right? There's a faith that if, it's, if it doesn't have action, it's dead. So right at the beginning, James lays out two types of faith. There is the no action faith, and then there's the action required faith. Two types of faith. All right. Now, James anticipates a response. Someone will say, hey, you have faith. I have deeds. You have pistons. I have air gone. Right? But what the, what the person is saying is, look, it's clear. You can have faith without action. It happens all the time. I can believe in something, and that belief does not require action. All right? James already said that's possible. It is entirely possible. So James says, okay, okay, okay. If that's the case, show me the kind of faith you have. What kind of a faith is it that doesn't require action? Show it to me. Actually, don't bother showing it to me. I'll tell you what kind of a faith it is. I'll give you an example of a faith that doesn't require action. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe. And shudder. James is talking about this faith that doesn't require action. He says that's a kind of a faith in the truth of a statement, the accuracy of a statement, like believing the sky is blue, believing that Paris is the capital of France, or, you know, if when it comes to theology, believing that there is one God, or believing that Jesus resurrected from the dead. These are things you can believe. Statements are, you agree are true. Do these statements require action? Well, no, they don't require any kind of action. Right? So here's the problem. Demons also believe. Demons are the spiritual forces who are in rebellion against God. And they believe that God is one. They believe Jesus resurrected from the dead. So if the demons the spiritual forces in rebellion against God have the same kind of faith as you do. What kind of faith do you have? And then <laughs> he goes on. He says, look, you want evidence? You, you foolish person, okay? James doesn't pull punches. Do you want, do you want more evidence, right? That pistis without ergon is useless. And then, so James says, look, you want some evidence from the Old Testament because that's really the only Bible they have at the time? And he says, look, I'll show you. I'll give you two examples. Two examples of faith that's combined with deeds. There's a story of Abraham and a story of Rahab. Now, this is where we need to remind ourselves that the Bible was not written to us, but for us. James, as you remember from the first week, is writing to Jewish Christians in the first century. Jewish Christ followers, and they know their Old Testament backwards and forwards, inside and out. Okay? They know the story of Abraham. They know the story of Ahab. The moment James mentions the two names, they're like, oh, yeah, oh, I see your point. Okay, I get it. For us, eh, not so much. It doesn't work for us as well. 
right? So if you're interested in the two stories, uh, go to Genesis 15 and 22 or go to, and, and go to Joshua chapter two. You can read about the story there. But what I wanna focus on is the conclusions that James draw from these two stories, right? From the story of Abraham, James says, here's the conclusion from the story of Abraham. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, ek ergon, and not by faith alone, ek pistis. And from the Rahab story, James concludes, as the body without the spirit is dead, so pistis without ergon is dead. That's the entire argument that James is making in this whole passage. And, and, And what does he say? He says, yeah, there is a kind of faith that exists that does not require action. But can that no action faith save a person? The answer is a resounding no. Rather, true faith requires action. The faith that can save you requires action. And at this point, I think a lot of people are going, whoa, I'm getting a little nervous about this. This is a little stressful. This is a little tense. I have all kinds of questions right now. So I I ask you to bear with me, and I'm going to try to explain this, and I hope it all become clear. At least I hope. (laughs) All right, let's let's get into it. Let's let's talk about the different kinds of faith that that are out there. Uh, Let's start with the kind of faith that James talks about, the kind of the no-action faith, the faith in the truthfulness of a statement. So let's say I have a faith in a statement. I I agree that Ottawa is the capital of Canada. I switch from, I'm into French speaking, aren't I? Okay, so I went from France to, to, to Canada. Okay, Ottawa, uh, in capital of Canada, um, I believe that God exists. I agree that Jesus is the son of God. Now, these are all statements that I agree with. And what actions are required out of faith in these statements? No action required. This is the kind of faith that James has been talking about, the no action faith. All right, let's talk about a different kind of faith. How about faith in an object? So, so here's a chair, and uh, what does it mean for me to have faith in this chair? Well, as a matter of fact, as a matter of statement of fact, I, I can agree, I can believe that the, this chair will support, will bear my weight, which is not true of all chairs. I have destroyed many a chairs. <laughs> I kid you not. Serena keeps a running tally of the chairs I've destroyed by sitting on them. She can describe the the process in excruciating detail. I think she relives them in her head. So, but believing this chair will bear my weight is a belief in a statement about this chair. But to really actually have faith in this chair, I need to do what? Yeah. This is faith in the chair. My faith is revealed by sitting on it. My sitting on it completes my faith. I'm not going to sit on it too long. (laughs) Don't want to test it. All right, let's try a different kind of faith. Let's talk about faith in a person. Now, faith in a person is different because it depends on the person and depends on your relationship to that person. For example, I have faith in my barber. I just got my hair cut. So I believe with the statement that she will do a great job cutting my hair. But that's not really faith in my barber. Faith in my barber requires action. It requires that I actually sit in front of her, take my glasses off. Wow, I shouldn't have done that. I can't see a thing. Okay. (laughs) I'm virtually blind, I'm sitting in front, there's a mirror and I can't see anything, and she's cutting my hair, and I need to trust that she will do a good job. I let her cut my hair. This is faith that requires action. Let's try another example. Let's try faith in a political leader. So let's say I have a friend who's running for city council in my city. And I, I know this person, I know their character, I know their convictions. I believe they will be great. They are so qualified for city council. I believe they will be great on the council. Does that require action? Yeah, right? I will vote for them. That's minimal. I might donate to their election election campaign, and I I could go door to door. I could talk to other people about voting for my friend. What I do here reveals the extent of my faith in my friend on the city council. What does it mean to have faith in Jesus Christ? Actually, let me rephrase that. What does it mean to have faith in Jesus as the Christ? You see, Christ, as you all know already, is not Jesus' last name. It's not Joseph Christ, Mary Christ, and Jesus Christ. Nope. Um, No, Christ is a title 
The Greek word is Christos. It comes is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get the word Messiah. Christ and the Messiah are exactly the same thing. One's in Greek, one's in Hebrew. Exactly the same thing. They both refer to the same thing. They refer to the future, the, the Hebrew king that God is going to send into the world to reestablish his reign over this entire earth. Which means the word Christ taps into the biblical story. Right? The biblical story begins like this. God creates a beautiful world and he creates humans to rule the world along with him. The humans rebel. As a result, the world falls into violence and sin and injustice and death. But more than that, the Bible tells us that the humans in rebelling, instead of achieving autonomy and freedom, no, 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 no. They fall under the power and the dominion of spiritual forces in opposition to God. They come under the dominion of the demonic forces. And so this world that we live in, the Bible tells us, is under the power of forces who are opposed to God. And God, in the story of the Bible, is trying to take the land back. God is seeking to reestablish his reign on earth. So we live in a world of spiritual conflict. How does God do that? What is God's plan to recover this world? He sends his son, Jesus, into the world to be the Messiah, to be the Christ, to be the final king of the universe, to establish his reign on earth, to defeat the satanic forces, demonic forces that runs this world. Now, how does he do that? He calls the people to himself. He calls the people who follow him, and then he dies on the cross. And in that death, his people are united into him. And something absolutely amazing happens. You see, First of all, their sins are forgiven because they're united with Jesus. But second, his people are drawn out of the dominion of sin and death. They're pulled out of the demonic reign and they're joined with him in Jesus. By the way, that's salvation. You have to understand this, okay? The biblical understanding of salvation is not saved from hell. It's saved from the domination of sin and death. You're no longer under their power. You're now with Jesus. That's salvation. But more than that, When you're in Christ, you are surrounded outside, inside, and through with the power of the Holy Spirit who is working on transforming you into his likeness. And it's empowering you and God's people together to be God's partner in restoring this world to his reign. Now, if you believe all of this, if you believe all of this is true, You have faith in the statement that Jesus is the Christ. Did you catch that? If you think all of this is true, you have faith in the statement that Jesus is the Christ. You do not yet have faith in Jesus as the Christ. This kind of faith requires an action. And what is that action? Jesus is Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the king. What does it mean to have faith in the king? You pledge allegiance to Jesus as the king. It's not, it's a, it's a move. It's an important move to move from Jesus is the king to Jesus is my king. Do you see the difference? In this world of spiritual conflict, it's to say, okay, in a, in a world of conflict, I'm on Jesus' side. I'm on his side of the battle. I I follow him. I want him to win. In fact, I'm going to do what I can to help him win. That's what's going on. That's what it means to pledge allegiance to Jesus. And when you do that, something amazing happens, something important happens, something life-altering happens. First, you are are pulled right out of the dominion of of, of spiritual forces who are opposed to God. You're, You're pulled out of the realm of sin and death. That's salvation, by the way. You are saved. And then second thing, you are united with Jesus. You're joined with Jesus. You're one with Jesus. You experience intimacy with Jesus. And then third, you're given the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is working on your transformation and working on empowering you to do the mission, to partner with God on what he's doing in this world. So as subjects of Jesus Christ, 
Here are the actions that are required. You have pledged allegiance to Jesus. So what, what, what do you need to do? Well, the Holy Spirit is helping you tr become transformed. You're going to prioritize that. You're going to figure out how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and trans be transformed so that you can become more and more like Jesus. And then you're also going to prioritize God's mission. Prioritize being part of the church community because the church community is the tool that God has chosen to change this world, to, re to, to reestablish his reign on earth. You will do these things, and you want to do these things. You do it voluntarily because that's what you signed up for, right? You pledge allegiance to Jesus. You want him to win, and you want to do what it takes to help him win. This is a faith that requires action. Right? If, 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 you, if you don't have this, if you just have faith in a statement that Jesus is the Christ, well, okay, but demons believe that. Demons know Jesus is the Christ. No, this is what needs to happen. This becomes a faith that saves. So, what ha so I hope this clarifies a lot of things because I think, I think the book of James is sometimes misread by people in church history to, to be saying that somehow you have to do certain things to, to qualify, do certain things to, 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 to earn God's um, you know, pleasure, to be able to qualify for getting to the kingdom of God. And, and, and that's not what James is saying at all, right? So if you look at the questions we had before, first of all, we are absolutely saved by grace through faith. What is the grace? Right? The grace comes from Jesus coming to earth, dying for us on the cross. Did we do anything to earn that? Did we have to do something for him to do that? No, not at all. That's all grace. Do you have to do something so that you can qualify? Is there a precondition before you can pledge allegiance to Jesus? No, absolutely not. At any moment, any time, you can pledge allegiance to Jesus. There is no precondition. It is all grace. It doesn't matter what you have done in your life. You can pledge allegiance to Jesus. You can put faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Okay, that's the phrase we use here at Blackhawk, as your Lord and Savior. That's the same thing as pledging allegiance. It's exactly the same thing. And when you do that, you are saved out of dominion of sin and death. Your sins are forgiven. They have no power over you. You are transformed and you are empowered for the mission. Second question. What if I fail? That's the wrong question. It's not if, it's when. We are going to fail. Of course we are. The moment we pledge allegiance to Jesus, it does not mean we're immediately transformed. No, so we are going to fail, and we're going to fail constantly. So what does that mean? Well, Jesus is our king. We fail, we get up, and we keep trying. We keep moving. Why? Out of obedience and out of the fact that we're being given this amazing gift. We're given the ability to live a life it looks like Jesus' life. That's the greatest gift possible, and we move toward it. So it's not about punishment. It's not about fear of punishment. It's not about, oh, I'm going to lose my salvation. None of those are even in the calculation. They, we, we, we just wipe them from the table. We don't even think about them. No. We are seeking to be, to be obedient to Jesus, my king. I want to live the life that he lived. That's what I want. And that's what the book of James is about, folks. The book of James is about us moving us, shaping us to live a life that Jesus lived, empowered by the Spirit for the sake of his mission. All right, let me pause here. Because like I said before, there's a lot of theology. <laughs> and for a passage that's about activating and being, taking concrete steps towards your faith, um, we need to do something different. So, um, we can talk, I and mean, we can literally talk about any concrete next step we want to, but what I want to do is be inspired by the passage, by the example that James used earlier. So, so James started with this story here about a brother or sister without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Right, that story right there is touching on our community. There's a major problem with food insecurity here in Dane County. So what I want to do is, is, is to, um, introduce you to some, a, a black hawker who has gotten involved in, in this area. 
So I'm gonna ask all of you in all the sites and venues to welcome to the stage Lisa Olmstead. Hi, Lisa, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you, Charles? Good, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> okay, so uh, Lisa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, how long you been in Madison? How long you been um, coming to Blackhawk? I've been in Madison since June of 1971, and I started at Blackhawk in 2009, because I lived down the road at the time, and we watched Braider Way being built. So out of curiosity, we decided to come in, wow. check it out. Okay, so building a building as a way of drawing people. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so you have been involved in um, uh, helping with the issues of, of, of food insecurity here in Dane County. Um, how did you get involved in that? Well, one Sunday, um, Impact Ministries was having their fair out in the atrium, and I stopped by and talked to um, a person from Badger Prairie Needs Network about the organization, and she encouraged me to come to a volunteer orientation. So I, I did a few weeks later and signed up right away because it was an amazing place, and it's yeah. all volunteer-run. Wow. Tell me more about uh, Badger Prairie Needs Network and, and kind of the work you do there. Um, well, it's located in Verona, Wisconsin, and it's um, right on Highway 151 and Verona Avenue. Um, I started working at the, um, the the first stop, I guess you would call it, where people come in and get their grocery carts, and then we explain the, the guidelines to them and then send them on their way through the, so, the different so, aisles. So people come in for the first time, they, they, they register, yes. and then you give them a cart, and they just kind of go. Right. And pick up the stuff they want. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So um, now, what do you do for them now? Now I'm in the, what they call the limited items section. Okay. Um, so so what, what kind of stuff is, okay, she told me this before. I just want you guys to hear it. Okay, what kind of stuff are in the limited item section? Uh, rice, pasta, spaghetti sauce, cereal, condiments. Wow. I, I just, I, when you first told me this, it kind of just kind of blew me away. Because when I think of a limited item section, I'm thinking, oh, are they luxury goods? But no, you're talking about staples. And right. We're talking about the things that feed people, feed family. You have a lot of families coming in, right? Yes. This year, they expect to serve over 80,000 people. Wow. Um, the numbers have tripled since before the pandemic. Wow. And so things, are, things are getting harder. There's a greater need for, for food and, and resources. Where does uh, um, Badger Prairie Needs Network get their food and get their materials? Uh, a lot of it comes from Second Harvest Food Bank, um, Community Action Coalition, um, local grocery stores. Epic is a big contributor. Yeah. Um, and then people bring in things from their gardens during the summer. And wow. We offer fresh produce and vegetables, a lot of dairy, uh, frozen meats. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh. So, so what happens if there's not enough of something? Do you guys? We have to rely on money that's donated by the public. Okay. to go out and, and buy the things that we don't have enough of. Wow, wow. So what's causing this sharp spike in needs? I think a lot of it is inflation. Yeah. Um, families' checks are just not going as far. And so, so these are not home, these are not people who don't work. These are working families. Correct. Right? And oh, wow. their, work, their wages are just not enough mm -hmm. to cover food. Correct. And then we have seniors who are on fixed incomes okay. and disabled people. Okay. Can't afford to work, so. Wow. Oh, okay. So um, if you want to learn more about food insecurity in Dane County, um, we actually have a class set up. Uh, it's called Food Insecurity Crash Course. It's going to be here at Braid Away Thursday, April 4th at 6.30 p.m. If you, if, if you, as you're hearing this, right, if you're like, is this something I want to learn about? Because this is happening in our community. Right? And food insecurity is increasing, um, and uh, it's tripled since COVID. Um, if you want to learn more about the situation and how you can get involved, I would strongly encourage you to sign up for this class. Right? It's a one-shot deal, one evening, and you can learn about how to get involved. So, Lisa, I see you actually around Blackhawk quite a bit. <laughs> so, uh, what, what else do you do uh, here at Blackhawk? Uh, I work at the welcome desk at B Kids, mm -hmm. and I serve on the care team on Thursdays, and I also... Um, I guess that's probably it for Blackhawk. Yeah, yeah. I also work at um, Attic Angel yeah, yeah. Uh, Residential that's great. Community. That's great. So, how has 
getting involved in volunteering, uh, especially dealing with food insecurity, how has that impacted your faith? It's actually transformed my life, like you were talking about just now. It's been amazing. The 14 years I've been here, um, I just feel so much closer to people and to Jesus and understand the Bible better. And this is my happy place. It fills me with joy to do this kind of work. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. Let's give Lisa a round of applause. Thank you. Faith requires action. That's the kind of faith we have. Now, we heard a lot today, and what I want to do right now is to offer us a time of reflection. So go ahead, and, and wherever you're at, the sites and venues, in front of a computer, right here in the room, go ahead and close your eyes. And I'm just going to talk our way through a time of meditation. I'm going to guide you with my words. The big question I want you to be asking yourself is, how is my faith lived out in my life? How is my faith lived out in my life? Now, I know for many of us, that you didn't, you didn't hear anything new today. You know that you have a faith that requires action. That you have already pledged allegiance to Jesus as your Christ, as your King, as your Lord. And you're seeking to live your life like Him. So t- right now is a chance to reflect on that. How's that going for you right now? In your work life, in school, family, friends, relationships, online, social media? What does it look like right now for you to be living out your faith? Go ahead and talk to God about that. But I know for some of you here and you're watching, this has been a very uncomfortable sermon because you're asking yourself the question, do I have a no action faith? Some of you, you've been coming to church years, decades. Some of you, you know a lot of theology. You know all kinds of stuff about the Bible. You believe all of it. But you're wondering, you're asking yourself, have I actually pledged my allegiance to Jesus as Christ? Have I made the move from Jesus is the king to Jesus is my king? Have I made a decision to to prioritize my transformation, to look for ways to cooperate with the Holy Spirit that is working in my life so I can live a life that looks like Jesus' life? Have I taken steps to prioritize time and relationship with God's people to strengthen the health of his church for the sake of his mission to the world? Have I done those things? If that's what you're feeling, if you're feeling uncomfortable, first of all, I totally get it. I was baptized, and for the next eight years, I learned the Bible, I learned theology, I learned a lot of apologetics. I can argue with people about the existence of God was eight years later that I actually made that decision to make Jesus the king into Jesus my king. Look, we believe God is real. We believe Jesus resurrected from the dead. That's all important, but it's more than that. It's more than that. This is a faith that requires a response. It is a faith that requires that we pledge allegiance to Jesus. We allow him, the Holy Spirit, to come into our life and we prioritize our transformation into his likeness because we want to follow him, we want to be like him. And we prioritize being part of his people for the sake of the mission. If you have not yet made that decision, now would be a good time. So I want to ask all of us, to, we're going to, Go into a time of prayer right now. And and I want to invite anybody, if you have never put your faith in Jesus, you have never pledged allegiance to Jesus as your king, whether you've been, this is your first time at church, or you've been coming for years or for decades, 
pray this prayer with me right now? God, who is our Father in heaven, right here, right now, I pledge allegiance to Jesus, your son, as my king. I want your kingdom to come to this earth. I want you to triumph here. I want you to win, and I will do what it takes to help you. I declare that I will try to figure out how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit because I want to grow. I want to change and be more, become more like you in, 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 according to your, the, the life of your son, Jesus. And I declare that I will join with your people, your church, for it to prosper for the sake of your mission to the world. If you just pray that prayer with me, <laughs> you are now a follower of Jesus. You have activated a faith that requires action. It is a faith that saves. And now for all of us, let me pray. Father, we pray for wisdom and for courage to live out our faith. We confess that we often fall short because we're too busy or we're too tired or sometimes we're just timid. And so we pray for your forgiveness and for your spirit to empower us to continue to transform us into your likeness. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us if you're able? We're going to sing of our King. I invite you to sing out. This is one you know well.
lift our banner high means we have pledged our allegiance with Jesus. Let's worship him. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you today to pledge allegiance to Jesus, whether that was a brand new decision or something that Charles said clicked with you in a new way and you've moved to this different kind of faith. Uh, first of all, scripture says that there are angels celebrating in heaven and that's an incredible life-changing decision. And hey, we wanna know about it. We would love to talk with you about what could be next. We have some tools that we'd love to get into your hands to help you take your next steps of faith. Uh, so you can feel free to come up here and talk to any of us or go talk to someone out at the Next Steps area. But if you're not ready to talk to someone quite yet, you also have a number that you can text. You can text YES to 608-618-4003. Just fill out a quick form. It'll let us know that you made that decision and you can opt in whether or not you'd like to have a conversation with a pastor or someone on staff just to be able to share about that and talk about what could be next. And hey, for all of us, Charles gave a great recommendation of a next step that we can take to put our faith in action by attending that crash course on food insecurity in Madison. We can learn about what's going on and how we can step in and engage with people in our community who are experiencing food insecurity. So that is a crash course. So you'll find it on our learn page under courses. But of course, again, you can talk to anyone up here or out at the Next Steps area. We would love to talk with you. If you've got someone you'd like to pray for or something you'd like to pray about, you can come up here to pray for that as well. But hey, we've been ending each service throughout the series working on a memorization challenge. And we're gonna do that again today. But I know a lot of you have been asking for some help, some tools with memorizing that. And so we have created a lock screen that you can save to your phone, a wallpaper, just to help remind you to be going through it and things like that. So you can scan that QR code or we'll throw it back up in just a second. Um, but we're gonna try to state the entire verse together. So if you think you have it memorized, you can close your eyes or look away from the screens, but we'll also have it up on the back screen if you need it. So let's say this together. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen? Amen. All right, everyone, go in peace. Have a great week.